Good morning. Today we are going to delve into a, a case from my case files that is 50 years old this year. And I got to be honest when I say this is one that I hesitate to do because it was the first case really that I caught a lot of grief over you have to understand is you know you're, you're as a cold case detective you're doing these cases and you're doing it to help family members help law enforcement help for justice and all of a sudden you know you do one where you are met with resistance from from both sides and it really it it shook me because I wasn't used to that. I wasn't used to, to getting hate mail. I mean, I am now, so it doesn't bother me. But at the time, and I'm going to say this was nearly, when did I do this case? Probably 2013. So it's been 10 years since I've done this case. And at the time, I just, I was taken aback by the hate mail after I rendered an opinion and you know the newspapers were involved and, and such and it was just uh, it was the first time that I just encountered anything like that so the gist of the story and, and I haven't decided I might do like a whole week's worth because this is a pretty big case and a lot of people don't want me to talk about this case, but it's important. There's a lot of, a lot of teachable moments in it for me, too. I learned a lot from this case. So the gist of the case is when October, I believe, is 19th, 1973, a young 12-year-old girl named Jennifer Hill goes missing from South Williamsport in Pennsylvania. And she was last seen around 4 p.m. leaving her friend's home, and that friend being Ruth Hubbard. Now, I want to qualify this by saying, as you guys know who watch me regularly, I do not like to use people's names other than their first names for the most part, um, unless there has been a conviction or the names otherwise has already been out in the public such as this case so i don't have i don't have an issue with saying the the names of the people involved but with that said you know i hesitate because i have so many viewers and subscribers that i don't want people to harass intimidate anything like that and that is another reason that I never I try not to use full names and stuff um, especially because I've seen what happened in these Delphine Idaho murders where people are harassing innocent people but it goes for convicted people in this case as well but you know I don't want people harassed but the names are already out there, and in fact, this uh, offender has his website and everything out there proclaiming his innocence. So, I'm I'm not too broken up about saying people's names. So, Jennifer Hill leaves the Hubbard residence. The Hubbard residence consists of Jennifer Hill's best friend, good friend, Ruthie Hubbard, same age. Ruthie Hubbard's older brother, Kim, K 
Tim is a boy. Uh, he's age 20, I believe. And then the parents. She's last seen leaving that residence at 4 o'clock. The walk home is about 10 blocks. And I believe it takes 17 minutes if I remember my uh, investigation correctly. But she never makes it. She disappears. And the search is on. Definitely out of character. And we'll get into victimology uh Later on, this is just an overview of the case that I want to give everybody to prepare them for what's about to come. Jennifer Hill's body is then found, I believe, October 28th. So, was it? Nine days later, in a cornfield. Uh, approximately, I want to say, maybe three and a half miles from where she was last possibly seen or known seen for sure without a doubt the Hubbard residence let's just say that because as she's walking she is seen by a number of people including a district magistrate who currently is a district magistrate who used to be my corporal in the police department and also police chief him and his brother saw her walking and they were ages 10 and 14 at the time I believe so it's weird how things tie into this uh, she's found and we'll get into how the body is positioned the clothing the evidence we'll get into all of that into a lot more detail as we move forward on this case but right now just know that she was found nine days later the investigation kind of starts turning within i would say a short amount of time after after that body was discovered on october 28th by november 1st and then certainly by like the end of november i start looking at Kim Hubbard, the 19, 20 year old brother of Ruthie, where Jennifer Hill had spent the night the previous night before going missing and was the last place she was seen. And we'll get into why eyes turn to him. And, you know, for fairly good reason. But we'll get into his background I, I met with him obviously during my investigation my impressions of him and and things like that um but he was eventually within you know a month or two arrested he went to trial he testified and his own defense um he was convicted by a jury of his peers and sent to prison for a 10 to 20 year sentence, second degree murder charge. He got out after 10 years of serving and moved right back to the same area where this crime occurred and proclaimed his innocence. That is when I got involved because he had started sending letters to the courts, the judges. And one of the judges that received this letter saying, hey, I'm innocent. I was framed by the government for this crime. Now, you got to remember, he's already done the crime or done the time for the crime and he's out. So now he's sending letters. To be honest, I found that endearing of him because here he could have simply vanished and said, you know what? I, I did my time, I'm over it, I'm moving on with my life. But he didn't, he was still proclaiming his innocence. And that intrigued me, but I didn't know anything about this case. This was a big case, 
for the county. And I didn't realize how big it was until I started investigating it. And I went to a library and I got on the microfiche and started looking at past newspapers and the, the coverage of the trial and things like that. It was big news. I didn't know any of that. I'm not from that area. So it didn't matter to me. But when the judges said, hey, gave the letter to the district attorney and the district attorney said, Kenny, you know, here. Actually, I think they gave it to my partner at the time, Al Diaz, and Al Diaz, myself, and the DA had a discussion and it was determined that it was better served if I worked on it for whatever reason at the time. Maybe he, he just didn't want to do it. Maybe he knew that I had passion for it, whatever. But in turn, it was given to me. I, I jumped on it. I was very excited to work on this case. And after I met with him, a whole lot of different developments that took place. Um, again, it was, uh, I'm speechless because I'm thinking back now, and I haven't thought about this case if, for a while. The amount of flack that I got for just investigating it. There was, I received letters, and I'll show you all this stuff. I received letters from people, uh, the mayor, the former mayor's kid called and uh, wanted to know why I was reinvestigating it. And um, just, yeah, I'm going to have to do a whole week's worth on it. I'll break it down into certain sections, um, but it's very very intriguing and, and compelling. Um, and it, it strikes me funny because when I, and if you've read my book, Unsolved No More, I have a chapter in there and that's what started this whole thing really going. I got a lot of hate mail after that book was released. Well, at the time I thought it was a lot of hate mail. I probably had five, six people blast me. You know, Hubbard, he has his supporters for sure. But I got a lot of nice emails too. Um, people saying, you know, this case had bothered me for so long. You finally put a bow on it, um, solved it. Listen, I didn't solve anything. Okay. And that's another misconception about this case. <clears throat> people want to get mad at me for my final opinion. Again, the district attorney who I worked for, said, here, solve this. I looked at it. Listen, it was already solved. Okay? The guy was convicted. He went to trial. The case is over. Now, if you want me to re-examine it and either confirm or dismiss what they did, I'll do that. But it has nothing to do with solving it. I give my opinion which you'll see, it was a, I don't know, 20 page findings uh, of what I found and why, which is important, why I found what I found. Still to this day, now this is 10 years after my investigation, somebody wrote a book or something called, I don't know what it was called, something about evil or somebody that wears a badge or something. And apparently there's some sections in there about me personally and I don't know for sure but I'm guessing they're trying to say that you know, I, I framed him or something uh, it's just again it's so ludicrous that you almost don't want to even talk about it uh and these people, number one, they're getting angry at me for an opinion that I came up with. I didn't convict the guy. I didn't arrest the guy. I didn't prosecute the guy. He was arrested by the Pennsylvania State Police. He was convicted and prosecuted by the Lycoming County District Attorney's Office in the 70s. He was sentenced and convicted by a jury of his peers. Not me. I'm not involved. I wasn't even born in 1973.
But these Hubbard supporters want to direct their anger at me. I, I, I didn't arrest them. I didn't convict them. I just looked at all the evidence, looked at the claims, and gave an opinion. But because I am, you know, I guess people want to say that I'm famous or I'm a true crime uh, celebrity and I get a lot more viewers, I guess, than the jury of his peers or his prosecutor or his arresting officer. I'm the one who's the bad guy. So they write a book and in include me in there and saying that I, f I framed somebody. <laughs> It's the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my entire life, okay? Uh, I'm certainly a non-biased opinion, and I remember meeting with Kim Hubbard the first time at the Humdinger restaurant where he was arrested. It was amazing, you know, we were sitting there, what, 40 years after he was arrested in that same establishment talking, and, you know, after I talked to him, you know, and we'll get into how he he, he is. Uh, very A-type personality, always wants to be in control. He, he speaks what he has to speak, and then, you know, at least at that time, you know, he waits for you to speak and give a retort, but yet he's not listening to what your retort is. He's formulating another thought and another opinion. You can You can tell. You know, when you talk to somebody, whether they're paying attention to you or not. Um, needless to say, uh, when I left that meeting with him, you know, I, I remember him saying, I'm glad you're here, you know, to exonerate me or something to those words. And I'll have those words for sure later when we go through this case, because I, you know, obviously took notes and put quotation marks and everything that he said. It was, very, it was a very meticulous investigation that I did on this. And in fact, uh, in my summation, which I read this morning, it was a year and some odd months of an investigation that I did. Now, that's a long time for a case that's already been through the system. Nobody cares about the case anymore. By that, I mean in the judicial system. It's been done. Guy's been convicted. He's sentenced. He did his time. And he's out. Again, so when Kim started sending me these letters saying that he was innocent, I paid attention. Because one thing that I'm very passionate about is innocent people being convicted. Um, again, I am not pro-law enforcement. And I'm not pro defense. I'm about the truth. Wherever that truth lies, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, it really doesn't. In this case, I looked at it the exact same way I do cases today. It, was, it wasn't my first case, first big case, but and it certainly wasn't my last, but it was one that had an endearing and not detrimental effect, but it had a lots of learnable moments for me personally as an investigator and as a human. But when I met with Kim Hubbard for the first time and he said something like, I'm glad you're here at exonerating, I corrected him right then and there. And I said, I'm not here to exonerate you. I'm here for the truth, wherever that lies. And I... And I remember specifically him leaning forward in my face. We were sitting at a small table and he had a coffee and he got inches from my face and, and emphatically said, I did not kill that girl. So I got a little bit more closer because I could see he was trying to intimidate me. And I said, I will find out. And he leaned back in his chair and said, had a smile on his face, I like you. That's how our meeting started. Now, 
I don't know if it was directly after that meeting or the next meeting that we had. And again, I will know for sure after I go through the case file here and I'll show you everything. I'm all about transparency, okay? I got nothing to hide. Again, I didn't convict him. I, you know, I just came with an opinion uh, after I was asked by my boss to look at it. But at some point, he emailed me and said, I think this case is bigger than you. Um, and it was shortly after the, I told him that I wasn't there to exonerate him. And of course, I saved all of his emails and everything that he had sent me. I want to make this very, very clear. I have nothing against Kim Hubbard. And it's funny that, you know, in any case that I've looked at, Darley Routier, uh, Jeffrey McDonald, uh, they all have their supporters. They all have them. The first time that I dealt with supporters was in this case with Jennifer Hill and realized that he had people that believe that he's innocent. And those supporters, you know, I want to use the, warm, the word attack, but I'll use that loosely. Um, you know, yeah, they, they sent me some emails and stuff, you know, saying that I was an idiot. And at the time, it bothered me. <clears throat> Um, it doesn't anymore. I'm so used to it. Uh, but I, I have nothing against Kim Hubbard. These supporters <clears throat> of him act like it's me against him. In the newspaper articles that came out at the time that found out, you know, what my opinion was and, and stuff and so forth, and where DNA became relevant when I reinvestigated it, where... In 1973, obviously, DNA didn't play a role in it. I mean, I I had people just hounding me, saying that I planted evidence. <laughs> it just, that part infuriated. It still, it still makes me mad because integrity, integrity, integrity. I live my life by integrity not just investigations my life in general and so for people to say that i planted evidence and i've come to learn that when people can't explain away certain things they will go to the planning of evidence theory all the time it took me a while to learn that but now i know that uh i i it's i almost don't want to address it because it's so absurd. But a lot of the things in this case, like the assertion that the girl's body was refrigerated and then placed back into a cornfield to be found and photographed two different times and a dental tie in her mouth. There's, there's a lot of absurdities that were spouted in this case. And some people really believe them. But I've come to learn, just like conspiracy theories, that you can't change people's minds if they believe those things. Um, so, you know, Kim Hubbard has his supporters and they, they badmouth me. And I, it is what it is. I, I have nothing against the man. Other, you know, he was convicted of killing a 12 year old girl. Whether he's a good person or not, uh, you know, I, I'm not the morality police, and I, and I say that a lot. My job as an investigator is to look at the evidence, look at the behaviors, relay that, and you like compare it to past cases and training and experience and come up with a conclusion if you can. That's all I did in this case. Um, I, I don't give two shits about his supporters. Uh, and I don't really care about the prosecution that convicted him. Uh, they're both irrelevant to me when I look at a case. It's non-biased. I don't care. I honestly don't care whether he or anybody, for that matter, did the crime or didn't do the crime. It doesn't affect me whatsoever. 
And that's what people don't understand. You know, conspiracy theorists, supporters on one side or the other, they have to find like a reason, okay? He's going against our thought. So what can we say? What can we throw against him to make it stick and make it look like he's biased? Insecure and ignorant people do that. I'm neither. Okay? So, at the end of this, I will show you reasons for Kim Hubbard's innocence, his guilt, why he was convicted, why he could be innocent, what I think happened, and we'll get into all that. Now, I do feel, one thing I do feel bad about is the victim's family. Uh, I hate bringing this stuff up. You know, the last time the newspaper called me and asked me to quote uh, on this case, you know, I, I said, you know, everybody wants to make this case about Kim Hubbard. But the most important person is who it should be about. And that's Jennifer Hill. It's never referred to as the Jennifer Hill case. It's referred to as the Kim Hubbard case. He's being remembered when she's not. And that is troublesome to me. I spoke, obviously, to Jennifer Hill's sister when I first started this investigation. I remember knocking on her door and her surprise that I was looking into it. But I was very transparent with her. Hey, I'm not doing this just for shits and giggles, right? I got better things to do. Kim Hubbard sent this letter. This letter went to the DA. DA told me to follow up on it. I'm going to do my job. That's why I'm here. And I had no idea at the time that Rhodes and the twists and the conspiracies and the framing and the, the bad-mouthing, all that was going to take place in my year-long investigation. And the, the, it continued long after that. Uh, people calling me, trying to get FOIA requests. This is after I retired. Some attorneys, supporters of, of Hubbard, bad-mouthing me because I wouldn't give them um, my reports. You know, hey, as far as I'm concerned, my official reports with DNA results and, and ser serology and all the things that I did, you, you got to go through the DA's office. That's where I work. There's a chain of command. There's a protocol set in place. You get mad at me because I'm a civilian now. I'm retired and you're sending things to my home address that you found and you think that I'm going to get back to you? You know? <laughs> Come on. People crack me up. Really do. Especially these conspiracy theorists. And, you know, and the people that want to say that I, me, who, who didn't even have anything to do with his conviction. I wasn't even born. Yet, I'm the reason that Kim Hubbard is frowned upon and I am dirty. I was a dirty cop. And I planted evidence. <laughs> uh, well, it shouldn't bother me because the, the people that know me, the people that worked with me and for me, I mean, and they know. Okay? So it's going to take me a little bit to go through the case file again and re-familiarize myself with stuff. But it's amazing to me that 50 years later, it's been 50 years, that this is going to stir up all this controversy again. And it doesn't have to be. Uh, but we're going to look at the evidence. That's what's important. Okay? And 
I'm not doing this for any other reason, then it's important to understand cases in the context of history and what we've learned. We've learned so much about behavioral characteristics, evidence, since 1973 when this crime occurred until today, 50 years later. It's, it, it's amazing. It's amazing to me the power that this case has in a, it's not a nationally known case. It's localized, but it's big, and it was big. I didn't realize that, again, because I wasn't born. I was in 1973. I wasn't born until 74, so. Uh, but the people that were alive during that time, they remember it. You know, and again, I want to make it clear. I have no bias towards Kim Hubbard, his supporters, nor do I have any bias against Alan Erdl or his descendants. He was the prosecutor at the time or the Pennsylvania State Police who investigated it and arrested Kim Hubbard. I have no bias against either of them. I have no favoritism towards either of them. Uh, it's all about the truth. It's all <laughs> True crime has to be about the truth. All the time. Every time. That's a, one of the problems with true crime today. For sure. People just want to spout their theories with no empirical evidence to back it up. You know, in this case, again, remember how I said everything has changed from 1973 to when I took over, reviewed this case in 2013. Uh, we got DNA now. We got different things that will help us solve the, the crime. So the evidence that helped convict Hubbard back in 1973, I sent out and had it tested forensically by the best of the best. Not just some Joe Smo working in some lab. At the time, I was the president and founder of the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases. I had the best of the best working for me. I had Joe Kenda, the homicide hunter. Okay? Warner Spitz, Cyril Weck. Dr. Henry Lee, Mary Ellen O'Toole, Ann Burgess from the Netflix show Mindhunter. Um, the list goes on and on. FBI criminal profilers by the handful. So I reached out to them. Hey, I need to know about these tire impressions that were found at the scene of the crime. Hey, boot prints found in the mud at the scene of the crime. I need them compared to this. Because, to be honest with you, I've had some bad dealings with the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab. And they are the ones that did all the forensic work in this case. I wanted an unbiased, non-related entity to look at it. See what I'm getting at? So these people that say that I framed him or I, whatever it is, is just ludicrous. I sent it out to the best of the best and had them look at the evidence and had them explain it to me. Whether they agreed with the original findings in 1973 or not. Um, and I'm going to get into all that. What DNA told me. How I got the evidence to begin with is amazing and almost unbelievable. It's so unbelievable that somebody might throw out the allegation of conspiracy and being framed. Some people say that I didn't even have that evidence. Oh, these double face palms are getting me. I shouldn't even do this case, to be honest with you, because it gets me so frustrated. But I'm going to try to maintain my level of composure. Um, 
and and make this a teachable moment. And that's all that I'm going to do. Again, this case is already out there. Transcripts. Kim Hubbard has his own website proclaiming his innocence. Um, I write my findings in my book. And it, if you... I'm, I'm sure you've picked up on it that our, con our, our findings <laughs> contradict each other. And when that happens, you're going to have friction. Okay? I pass by Kim Hubbard's, Hubbard's house... Four days a week. Yeah, and it used to be five days a week, okay? I see him. I pass him, okay? I, I got nothing against the guy, but people want to create this friction, you know, that it's, a, it's the detective against the convict. I, I got nothing against the guy, okay? I just look at the evidence use my training and experience and say what I believe happened based off of the evidence. So we'll get into it. Be a couple part series, I'm assuming. Probably at least three or four parts. A deep dive into the murder of 12-year-old Jennifer Hill on October 19, 1973 in South Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And again, I'm sorry that I'm bringing this up for the victim's families. And to be honest with you, I hope they don't watch this. I have too much respect for them. Uh, what they, Just like I do all victims' families. To what they have endured throughout the years, they don't deserve that. Um, just like the defendant's families, you know. They don't always deserve, sometimes they do, because sometimes they're complicit. But oftentimes they didn't do anything either, and they're ridiculed. So I have empathy for them as well. Um, now, I was badmouthed again by the defendant's family, and I get that. You know, I, I understand that. Family is going to stick up for family, and I. I get it. And so I don't take that stuff personally. I understand it. But again, I think their anger is misdirected. Where if you want to be angry at somebody, be angry at the juror. You know, the people that convicted your loved one. Not me. Or maybe the arresting officer. Not me. Or maybe... The prosecuting attorney. Not me. Maybe the judge that presided the case. Not me. I didn't do anything. But I have broad shoulders and I'm used to it. So I'll take it. This murder is a very teachable moment. And had a, a direct impact on, on my life as an investigator. And as a human. And I will get into all that. Reluctantly. A little bit. But I think it's important to get it out there and show everybody what I see, what I know, and the truth be told. No matter what side it lies on. If it exonerates Kim Hubbard, good. If it doesn't, good. It's all about the truth. Remember that. It's never about the prosecution. It's never about the defense. It's about the truth. And the people that can't see that and they want to be biased one side or the other and look at everything through that lens, they're not credible and they're not worth listening to. So tune in the next couple of shows. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of this case. And remember, it's the case of Jennifer Hill. Remember that. Not the case of Kim Hubbard. So with that said, look forward to it. Mains out. Well, I